Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. This is Katie Roper with Caring.com, and I'm thrilled to have you here with me today for 100% occupancy or bust, why 87% isn't good enough. Before we get started with the content of our, our meeting, I want to go through a few housekeeping items. The presentation will be available in a few days. We'll be sending it out. And also, this is a one-way webcast, but we do encourage you to ask questions. There's a question panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end, we'll be taking questions. So feel free to type them in there. And um, we'll collect them up and go through them at the end of, of Tony's presentation. Um, now, since this is a free webinar, you get to sit through a little commercial. Um, Caring.com, the company I work for, is the host of your webinar today. And we are the number one site helping family members care for their elderly loved ones. We have uh, articles, content, tips, advice, checklists, um, over 125,000 consumer reviews. We get 3 million monthly visitors every month coming to our site for help with their elderly loved ones. And we're also part of Bankrate, which is a network of websites helping people with content online. If you're not already working with Caring.com to have us refer out some of the 3 million people we talk to every month, um, feel free to check the box at the end of the webinar and we'll have someone get in touch with you. Okay, I am thrilled to be joined today uh, by Tony Mullen. He, as many of you know, is a longtime uh, industry luminary. He's been in the sales trenches um, and the operations of senior housing companies for um, well over 20 years. And he is not only the, the co-founder of a couple of programs at, at major universities, but he also has his own company and every year runs uh, the Advanced Sales Summit Conference. And I had the privilege of attending last year and thought it was terrific. So. Um, I am thrilled uh, to have him with me. And I'm actually getting a, a comment here, Tony. It says, yay, go Tony. Allegro has been at the Sales Summit every year for 10 years. So um, if you're not already going, it's, it's definitely worth putting on your calendar. Well, thank you very much. Um, our agenda today is I'm going to set the stage a little bit talking about some of the things that Caring.com sees with senior housing sales. And then I'm going to turn it over to Tony. And um, he's going to talk about some ways that you might be able to shift the focus and make your, um, your sales efforts more impactful, but also really change the company culture to be one where 87% uh, occupancy is, is just not good enough. Um, so before we get started here, I'd like to ask everybody to help us out and take a little poll. Um, so uh, you should be able to see the poll now. And um, just go ahead and check the, the little circle um, and let us know to, to give us all a sense of, of where the people on this call are, are going. Um, we will share the results, so sit tight. Uh, looks like about 60% of people have already voted. We'll get a few more here. Seventy percent, awesome. Thank you everybody who's voting. Tony, I'm going to be interested to see what you think, um, how this compares to industry averages. All right, it looks like we are close to 80% here, and that's about what we usually get. Um, so thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. 
and then I'm going to share the results. And here you can see, um, looks like mostly people are sort of 85 to 95 percent occupied. That looks like over half the people on this call. Um, yeah, I think it's very, very representative of what's actually going on. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for that. Um, let's let's dive in here. Um, so, uh, Tony shared with me some stats from NIC, which of course is the authoritative source for uh, senior housing data. And what you can see here is industry-wide, we're running about 91% occupancy for independent living properties and uh, closer to 88% for assisted living properties. And, um, you know, Tony, I guess what I would ask is, you know, this is sort of A minus B plus range. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to really see that that's something we should be proud of. How do you think it's gotten to be, you know, sort of generally accepted that it's okay to be, you know, running in the B plus range? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I would give it a B plus. To me, it's really much more of a C plus, B minus, just simply because there are so many people that inquire, you know, who never move. And there's a good percentage of them who would move if we had the right professional selling skills that we were using with those people. And so that's the great you know, mystery of why we, we don't do better at this. But occupancy has been under real pressure, and uh, it won't abate anytime soon. I don't see it getting better uh, probably until 2018 or later, you know, quite some time away. And the reason is there's a shrinking pool of customers who can afford what we now offer. If you look at assisted living, it's now routinely running over $60,000 a year in most markets. Uh, memory care routinely running over $80,000 a year in most markets. And even independent living rental, you know, we're now running close to $40,000 a year in most markets. And so uh, there's just a shrinking pool of people who can afford uh, those amounts and who find it to be a good value. When we ask the question on value, uh, do people find this a good value? It used to be very high. It's really dropped dramatically over the last 15 years as you know, we've measured that. The second reason is, is that you know, competition in the industry has grown to the point where you know, we probably have more assisted living units under construction in the country than just about any time in the last oh, 15 years or more. And uh, there are parts of the country where it's much easier to build like you know, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, you certainly Texas, uh, and some other parts of the country, you know, which are really suffering because of the competition. And then the third reason is the growing competition from home care, uh, especially home care services and independent living, you know, which is uh, clearly one of the ways people are trying to avoid assisted living. So for all of these reasons, and none of which are going to abate anytime soon, occupancy, the pressure on occupancy is going to continue. And, uh, you know, we, we, we just simply, the only way people are going to get better is to do something differently than they've been doing. Yeah, and um, one thing that I think people tend to forget is that um, it's a problem, you know, for the, the consumers or the residents in, in senior housing, but it's also a real problem for the companies. That's right. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the, again, it depends upon how much debt is used, you know, versus equity when a project is developed. Uh, but, but the reality is the, the amount of profit that is not earned because people are stuck at 87, 88, 89 percent occupancy or even below is extraordinary. I mean, it's so large that it's almost mind-boggling to people who really don't have a good you know, understanding of the numbers in this industry. But I'll just give you one very uh, typical example. A community of 100 independent living units, 50 assisted living units, and 25 memory care units. 
So a total of 175 units. Uh, that property, by going from 88 to say 99% occupancy and staying there, will produce $700,000 a year in additional cash flow profit. $700,000 a year. I mean, the numbers really are extraordinary, which is why you know, this becomes so very important to many companies. But right. the reality yeah. is there's, there's a real what we call status quo bias and that you know, people feel, well, everybody else is kind of stuck. This is where the industry is. And I guess that's kind of where you know, we're going to be just because you know, we're part of the industry. And that, that's a real flawed way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, cuz you don't you don't need to add another activities director when you go from 93% occupied to 96% occupied. That's you don't right. need to add another receptionist, you don't need to add another uh administrator. So the yeah. higher levels of occupancy are just a lot there's a lot more uh cash being generated there which can either flow back to shareholders or it can be reinvested in helping more people or reducing the costs or whatever. Yeah, and the very best companies actually share that with their employees and that's what creates kind of the virtual cycle that allows, you know, what uh, uh, some you know, people call the flywheel that, you know, really allows, you know, the company to get much, much better because it's reinvesting in their people and sharing the, uh, the profits with their people. Yep. All right, so now um, we've talked a little bit about some of the, the company things. Let's talk a little bit about the sales world. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of data from Caring.com, what we see working with lots of partners in the industry here. Um, this is an example from a mystery shop that we did for one of our clients. I took out the numbers so that you can't figure out who it is, but this is somebody with with you know, a, this, is a, this represents a good number of communities. And when we sent them out a lead, and this was a, a mystery shop lead, so it was a good lead. It was somebody who was a clear fit for the community with plenty of money and a real sense of urgency. This wasn't your sort of meh, you know, maybe I'll call this one, maybe I won't. And you can see that at this company, which is one of the industry leaders, only a little over 50% of the communities contacted that lead within 24 hours. And 18% never contacted them at all. So, um, so what does this mean for the people moving into the community? And this is data from our recent caregiver journey survey. We, we do this every year. And our webinar in September went into a lot more detail. So if you're interested, in some of the other stats, you can find a, a link to the recording for that webinar on our blog. But we asked people whose loved ones were already living in senior housing what prompted the move. And you can see here medical concerns and safety concerns, uh, twice as high as any other issue. You can pick more than one issue from this list, but you know almost everybody mentioned those. And you understand why that is, because if the salesperson never calls you back or waits three or four days to call you back, the only reason that you're ever going to move into a senior community is because you have to, because of a medical diagnosis or you're afraid for your, your mom or dad's safety. You can see how low down the list there are all the sort of lifestyle things, the socialization things, all of those great benefits that senior housing offers are just not really in the consideration set. Yeah, I think that's well said. I also wanted to mention, this is some data that, that you shared with me yesterday, Tony, about average time from inquiry to move in. And you can see that 30% of people who move into independent living and 60% of people who move into assisted living are moving in within the first 90 days. And again, that's another a little bit of evidence that shows how it's really only people who absolutely have to do this who are making that decision. Yeah, this, this is really, I think, one of the most important uh, things that people can focus on that would really help them understand why always focusing on, you know, the new leads, the hot leads is a mistake. 
it's probably the greatest mistake that is made in the industry today. Let me repeat that. Focusing on your new leadage and your hot leads is the greatest mistake that's made in the industry. There's nothing even a second in my opinion because so many people do take more than 90 days and they need a trusted, likable person that they can work with that really cares enough to get to know them and this takes time and there are skills that you, you need to bring to bear to be able to balance your need to fill the turnover of, of units each month, but to be able to do more than that, because right now most companies only are being able to move in what they're turning over. They're making no progress. So to make progress, you must do something differently. The reality is you need more selling time and you need more productive selling time with the right skills. It's the only way you can ever break out of this conundrum. But this is the evidence right here why it's so important to be able to work with ongoing leads and not just your most recent and hot leads. But the reality is the vast majority of salespeople in our field you know, believe they're doing that, but in actuality they're really not doing it and they're not doing it successfully. But hopefully people on this call are, are, are here because they want to learn, all right, so tell me what it is that the very best people do, and that's what we'll get to over the balance of the call. All right. So let's talk about how we can shift people's focus from the new and the hot to uh, really deepening relationships. And um, you sent me this, this quote from Peter Drucker, who, of course, is one of the the real management gurus and has been for a long time. Um, talk to us a little bit about why this is so important and, and what uh, Peter Drucker has, has to, to share. Now basically, you know, for anybody to have a sustainable co competitive advantage, they have to be able to be in business you know, with, with something that's going to cause them uh, to be able to serve the needs of a customer uh, where the customer finds value and, and the reality is, it's almost never about the product. I mean, certainly the product has to meet certain minimum specifications. But you can have the greatest care, the greatest uh, location, the greatest everything. But if people don't know about it, and if someone isn't there to help them make a decision, it really ultimately doesn't matter how good the product is, because it will fail. And so that's why marketing is so important. And then certainly being innovative, you know, to make sure that, you know, you can keep up with what the market wants, even though your property might be 20, 25 years old, is another important component. But the sad part of this is most people mistakenly believe that marketing is lead generation. And that's just a tiny, tiny part of it. In the, in the initial stages, it's about product, uh, place and pricing, right? But those decisions are almost always made by the owners and the senior leaders, but the people in the trenches, the regional sales leaders, and even the you know corporate executive for sales, uh, you know, we need to understand that ultimately professional selling is a part of marketing and it's ten times more important than lead generation in our field. Let me repeat that. Professional selling is 10 times more important than lead generation in our field. The reality is almost every community, 99%, have enough leads to be 100% occupied. What they don't have is enough professional salespeople or enough professional selling time with the right skills. One of the easiest ways to overcome this is to hire another professional salesperson. Uh, it's the best investment any property below 90% will ever make, period, end of story, ever make. But again, it's very difficult to uh, be able to show executives this uh, without let letting them see the numbers. But most of them are pretty savvy, and when they see the numbers, they finally come around. But the reality is that personal selling trumps everything. And it's so important that it actually can make you truly unique because to have a sustainable competitive advantage in any business, you either have to be the low price leader like Holiday Retirement is in our field, 
you have to be the best value. The problem with the best value is that virtually everybody competes for that position. And in every market, you normally have five or six competitors that you're competing against. So only one can objectively be the best value. So you have probably maybe about a 14, 15, 16 percent chance of actually being the best value. But in our industry, because the, the care and service fees are purposely obfuscated from the customer, it's very, very difficult to even understand who has the best value because of the way everything is basically, it's, it's very, very difficult to compare apples to apples. So most people kid themselves thinking they're the best value. So the last option is to be truly unique. For example, a kosher property in an area with a lot of Jewish people, and it's the only one, that would be truly unique. But there's very few truly unique properties in our business today. But those who master professional selling, and I'm thinking of uh, companies like David Smith. I'm thinking of companies like uh, 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 the fellow from uh, Nebraska whose name escapes me. Uh, but I, and I'll think about it. He runs a company, uh, about five properties out there, does a remarkable job of professional selling. And, uh, but these companies become truly unique because it's so rare. And that's yeah, why. and I think, I think the interesting thing, and, and what I love about this slide, Tony, is that you can take a, a community and turn it into a truly unique one by these, these, these particular sales techniques, which, which anybody can do and anyone can learn, right? That's right. That's right. Any, anybody can learn these. Now, certainly some personality types have, a, have, a, have an advantage, but the reality is almost anyone can learn these skills. Okay. So, great. So, let's dive into some of the things that it takes to, to have a real professional selling organization. Yeah, the, the, there are three main elements to this, and you know what I've learned in, in doing this a long, long time is that probably 90% of sales professionals in our field have never even heard of them, let alone have mastered them. You know, the first is called motivational interviewing. The second is understanding the science of how one changes their mind or the stages of the of change that we go through before we actually change our minds. And then finally, the, the third is there's a whole science of human influence of how, how we actually can ethically uh, motivate or move other people um, you know, when we know it's the right decision for them. But motivational interviewing is probably uh, the, the uh, foundational element. And it comes out, it's been around for 50 years, it comes out of the whole behavioral science field. Um, and it's basically about, first of all, you know, giving up the result uh, because truthfully, you know, we, we come at this as people kind of trained in a classic Zig Ziglar kind of uh, approach to selling, you know, let's get out there, let's qualify our leads, uh, you know, let's start to engage them and, and find out a uh, little bit about who they are and then we, you know, we want to dump on them uh, all of our benefits and features and try to immediately qualify to get them in for a tour, right? And that's truthfully, in 95% of the cases, that's absolutely not what a prospect wants. Matter of fact, they're trying to take the opposite position from us. So we automatically get into an adversarial position with about 95% of our prospects. Well, motivational interviewing, the whole science behind it is, you know, giving up that result, becoming a trusted uh, uh, advisor who really gets to know the person by asking a, a number of, of open-ended questions. Uh, helps the person understand what they're really seeking, you know, what their, their problems are, uh, and, and doing that in a way that doesn't make them feel badly about themselves because no one wants to feel that they're dependent or they become frail or, you know, they have problems that they can't solve for themselves. So how you go about this is there's a, you know, there's a whole science we can't possibly cover. But I just I want to help people understand that if they master this science of motivational interviewing, um, and there's other elements, you know, providing affirmations, engaging in reflective listening, uh, being able to summarize back what the person says. So the truth is, it 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 really takes about a year to start to become proficient once one goes down the path of seeking to master this skill set. 
of motivational interviewing. But uh, in my own research and studying the people who do this, the, the top 10 percent, they are all using some element of motivational interviewing uh, in the in the skill set that they use personally. And again, any of the people listening who know David Smith and Alex Fisher, they'll know that this is exactly how they go about it. And the reason they do is because it works, and it works exceptionally well. So Tony, can you give us just an example of what an open-ended question might look like in a senior housing selling situation? Yeah, I mean, you know, the you, you want to first get permission to ask personal questions, and you want to explain very quickly why it's, it's very important that uh, you're able to ask these questions because in order to help you I really need to understand uh, your situation as well as you do, you know, the prospect. And so once you, you engage in questions and get permission to ask personal questions, you can start to ask things like, you know, really, you know, tell me about yourself and how long you've been in the area and what kind of got you to today you know, in terms of, of calling us. So you're, you're really, it's almost a broad, open-ended approach that is really trying to just get to know who the person is. You know, you're trying to validate them as a human being. But the vast majority of people in the traditional Zig Ziglar approach are taught, you know, to try to qualify the person quickly so you don't waste time. And certainly you don't want to waste time with people. But if the first thing that you're going to ask somebody is, you know, have you decided you can afford it, it's not going to start a meaningful uh, relationship based in trust and likability. Or if the first thing you're asking them is, well, could you come in Tuesday or Thursday afternoon? You know, or could, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's so that kind of a Zig Ziglar traditional approach absolutely will never get you very far in our industry. You will never be more than average. And I don't think anybody is on this call taking time out of their busy day to be average. You know, I um, the one thing I would add to what you said is I think when you're asking the open-ended questions, you have to somehow get to the point where you're actually interested in the answer. That's right. Because I, I just yesterday got a sales call. And of course, I've been in sales a long time and managed salespeople and set up a lot of sales organizations and and I picked up the phone which I, I hardly ever do because I'm hardly ever at my desk but it rang and I picked it up and the person on the other end said oh hello how are you today yeah and immediately yeah. my my right. guard was up yeah I'm like he doesn't really care how I am yeah. uh, this is the most perfunctory question he's just yeah. trying you know he's trying to sell me something and so immediately from the first, you know, three seconds of the call, I was on my guard and it was not a comfortable situation. So yeah. the one thing I would, I would add to this is that you really actually do have to get to the point where you're interested in the answer. Yeah, and if you're not, then obviously you're not in the right profession, truthfully. I mean, if you really are not willing to spend 15 minutes with someone, no matter whether they're qualified or unqualified, uh, you really are probably in the wrong profession. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, um, let's talk about stages of change here. This is another one of the skills that you, you uh, were mentioning. Yeah, this Tell is, us a little bit about how this works. Again, also comes out of a whole behavioral psychology field in terms of the science of how people actually go about you know, coming to a, a decision, especially a large change in, in like, you know, moving out of one's house that you've lived in for 40 plus years. And we, we all go through this in no matter what, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, to, to, to relocate, to take a new job, whatever. It, there are six stages, pre-contemplation where we're really not even, you know, uh, it hasn't kind of even entered our radar yet. Contemplation, we're aware of, of the issue and we're aware of potential solutions. Preparation is where we really start to, you know, decide, okay, I'm going to look at places. I'm going to start to evaluate what it really costs. Can I afford it? And then finally, the action stage where someone actually says, okay, I'm going to move, I'm going to go, you know, and fill out the paperwork, I'm going to put my house on the market, and then move. So there's kind of, there are kind of various elements of the action stage. The maintenance is, am I happy here? Am I going to stay here? Because there is a lot of voluntary turnover today. So part of what, 
you know, operations and marketing and sales need to do together is to make sure people are, are having a good experience and are, are cared for and are made to feel at home. Uh, there's a lot of research going on there about how to make people feel at home. And then finally, you know, terminating the decision is if they did move back out. So most of the people we work with are in the early stages of contemplation. They're nowhere near action. But what we're trying to do is force them into action far sooner than they're willing to go. And that's what turns people off. And that's why most people don't get back to you, because they don't want to be pressured anymore. Yeah, and, and you know, I would add two things to that. The first thing is on the importance of maintenance. In our caregiver journey survey, we found that 17% of people who reported a loved one living in a senior community, they had moved to the new senior community from a different senior community. Yeah. And that number, I was amazed at how high that was. And it's, it was so high that we didn't even ask a follow-up question to find out why, because I had no, no idea it was going to be that high. Yeah, no, it's definitely becoming an issue, uh, the voluntary turnover. And uh, the other element of the stages of change and why this is so important to master is because it really does help you to prioritize who you're going to spend time with. Now, most companies have a top 10 board, top 15 board, which is a very, very good idea. But how do you choose which of those people to spend your valuable time on and how much time? That's really driven by understanding where a person is in the stages of change. So obviously somebody who's very far down uh, preparation, you know, obviously you're going to spend a lot more time with uh, to get to know and, 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 and really enter into a, a deep personal relationship. Somebody's at the very early stages of contemplation, you know, you may not spend as much time with at least in the, in the first uh, uh, meeting, but, you know, there are then skill sets you'll use to try to help them get from contemplation up to preparation and to the action stage. So, you know, for example, you've got somebody on your top 10 board that's in pre-contemplation, you probably are making a mistake. You see what I'm saying? So this is a good way to, to be able to use your, with your top 10 board and also to, to figure out how to ration your valuable time. Yeah, and, and Tony, we're getting some questions here about wanting to go deeper into some of these things. You had sent me a list of some books yes. that, that cover off this stuff. Can you um, just quickly give us you know, a little bit of a sense of, of what are some of the signs that somebody would be, be getting ready to move? say from contemplation to preparation or what could a sale, is, is there a thing or yeah. two that you could mention? Yeah, people do back, they bounce back and forth between these stages. It's important to say that the, the best book on this is called Changing for Good uh, by a gentleman named by Pro, Prochaska. Uh, there's two other offers, De Clemente's one, but it's called Changing for Good. I, I would really urge people to get it because we're, we're not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time digging into this stuff, but, but basically you know, you, 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 people will give you signs. For example, somebody uh, that's still in contemplation is really still stuck in ambivalence in the sense of, I see some of the reasons it would be helpful to move, but I'm not sure that I can really afford it. I'm not sure I'm going to be happy there. I'm not sure I'm going to fit in. You know, that, that would be a person that's kind of still stuck in contemplation. A person who's now in preparation might be now willing to say, okay, I've come in once for a visit. Uh, I thought it was nice. Uh, I'm not ready to do anything yet, but I am willing to come back uh, to maybe one of the events, educational events that you're having. You know, that would be somebody that I think would still be, uh, you know, in early stages of preparation, but People don't keep coming back to your community unless you know, they kind of really are starting to move uh, towards a decision to, to move into your community, you know, which is yeah. why having ongoing events at your community is so important, you know, at least monthly events at your community. Uh, but you know, a lot of people talk about events, but they don't run them often enough. And they've got to be good events with good speakers, you know? Yeah. Um, the other thing that, that I think it's really important, you, you know, you hear a lot of people complain about Internet leads and, oh, the Internet leads, they never call me back. They're just kicking the tires. 
the thing that I that we coach our family advisors here about, and that I want to point out is, people are not stupid mostly, and they mostly know what's going to happen when they fill out an internet lead form. So you don't do that just for grins, right? If you're just kicking the tires, you're probably not going to type your name and phone number into a form and and you know, face the fact that salespeople are going to start calling you. So there's yep. something there. There's some yep. reason that they took action today, and whether that's going from pre-contemplation to contemplation or contemplation to preparation. And we really try through our discovery process to find out what's driving you. You know, what's the reason that you chose today to do this? And that's something that, that I've always heard as, as being a a real key in, in selling, you know, find out why now. Yeah, and I think that's well said, and, and the reality is, is that most people have a need, but we have never given them the time and attention to help them come to their own decision that this is the right thing, and it does take time. It typically takes 20 hours or more in assisted living, and it can easily take 10 to 15 hours in, in, in independent living rental. And so the problem is we just don't have enough productive selling time because we're, we either don't have enough people or we have our salespeople spending too much time on marketing, administrative, uh, and then we're not giving them the skills that they need by allowing them to practice these things because these things have to be learned and practiced. You're not going to become an expert in motivational engineering stages of change in six months. You know, there are people that have been doing this for five, ten years, you know, consistently that still know how much they need to learn. I mean, this is kind of a lifelong uh, activity. Now, you can get a lot better in a year, but you're kidding yourself if you think you can master this stuff in six months. The reality is you'll see improvement, but you really need to stay with this. you got to practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Um, and I think, Tony, we're going to talk about that, that search for knowledge and search for mastery a little bit later. Let's quickly cover um, some, of the, some of your ideas about human influence, because I think this is interesting, too. This comes out of the work of Robert Cialdini, uh, C-I-A-L-I-D-N-I, -I -I, Cialdini. He also just came out with a brand new book, which is phenomenal. I'm in the midst of reading that. But He's been around for oh, 45 years. He's one of the preeminent social psychology scientists in the country. And there are others, Albert Bandura, um, and there's a number of others as, uh, that it work in the same field. But he's the most well-known. And there are six major laws of human influence, how we ethically uh, influence other people. And by knowing them and knowing where they can be used, it can dramatically dramatically in, in impact or make better your work in motivational interviewing in the stages of change. Uh, the rule of reciprocity, for example. You know, if you send somebody something that's of real value, even though it doesn't cost very much, they're much more likely to pick up the phone and speak with you when you call them. So the very best, you know, professional salespeople use the law of reciprocity by sending things on a regular basis to their prospects that have real significant value. For example, there, you know, there's a number of good little short books and articles that, that people will use that can make a dramatic impression on other people. Um, the whole understanding of uh, authority and why you want to be perceived you know, as an authority uh, you know, obviously more people are going to get on a phone call like this if the fella has 30 years of experience and he's, you know, been involved in starting things like the NIC NIC map database, right? So, I mean, that's just the reality. People want to try to learn from other people who are considered authorities. And so there are ways to kind of help position yourself, you know, as an objective person of authority when you do this, but you certainly can't do it in the Zig Ziglar way because you're going to be perceived as a salesperson. Peer yeah. proof, uh, you know, it's just the fact that there's many other people like themselves that are already uh, living in the community and the very best people use the very best residents who are similar to uh, that prospect 
and have them get involved with the process because that's how peer proof works. And so having residents who invite other prospects over for dinner or to something they enjoy doing, you know, let's say they're a history buff and they're coming over you know, for a, uh, a great lecture on history at that person's apartment. I mean, there's the kinds of things that the most sophisticated companies are doing. Uh, in, in terms of liking, the single greatest way to be liked by prospects is to genuinely listen to them. If you're doing more speaking than listening over the half hour, then you know your likability is dropping. If you're asking good open-ended questions and you're listening and, and really asking good follow-up questions, you're going to simply be liked more. Um, it's incredible the science around that, that liking uh, in many ways comes down to how well the other person is listening to me. Um, and so, again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time getting but but there's a number of things here that will make people uh, dramatically more effective uh, over time in, in helping people to move in. And I'll give you an example. Most sales professionals today in our field, they close about 22%, 22% of their visits. Now, most people call them tours. I don't. I call them visits because no one wants to be toured. People like to visit with other people. And so, uh, the very best people who master these three skill sets of professional selling, motivational interviewing, stages of change, and the science of human influence, they will close 45 to 50 percent, so double what the typical sales professional. Now, it, it's true that they'll have fewer visits or tours, but the reality is they'll still outproduce the typical salesperson uh, by about two times, uh, maybe not quite double, but, but seven, 60 to 70 percent they typically will outproduce over the course of a year and the number of sales or move-ins that they generate. And so the reality is this is what companies want is you know, to move all their sales professionals you know, uh, up dramatically, but it can't happen without uh, mastering these three uh, professional skill sets. Yeah, terrific. Um, I'm uh, I, I'm thinking about our own processes here as I'm listening to you, Tony. So thank you for that. I do also want to mention to everybody listening that we will send out the list of books. It'll be in the e follow-up email that you'll get. Um, I I think it's scheduled to go out tomorrow. So watch your email for that. We also will send out a link to the recording and to the slide deck. So. It, it really comes down to people, doesn't it? Both uh, hiring the right salespeople, uh, training the right salespeople, and then find, giving them the tools they need. And this was actually one of my favorite slides. Um, I, I came up through the high-tech world. I'm not a career senior housing person. And so I found it so interesting, uh, the comparison of people who succeed as high-tech salespeople and the people who succeed as senior housing salespeople. So talk to us a little bit about some of the data on this slide, which I think comes from your own research. Is that right? Yeah, I did this with Dr. Uh, Watson. Uh, he's a terrific uh, doctor of psychology that I've worked with, Dr. Russ Watson. And uh, we tested uh, a number of uh, the top you know, salespeople in different companies in senior housing and compared them to other uh, industries, especially high-tech salespeople. Now, this scale is 1 to 70. The scale is 1 to 70. So you can see the drive for money among high-tech salespeople is, is extraordinary. It's less so for the top salespeople in senior housing, but the drive to help other people is, is very low on a scale of 1 to 70 for high-tech salespeople, just you know, about average. But for senior housing people, it's about almost 25% more. Uh, than it is, you know, for 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 high tech salespeople. But what's really important is to see kind of the balance between the drive for money and the drive to help others. You know, they're almost equal there at 50. And so that's what's unusual about the makeup of the best salespeople in our industry in senior housing is they balance the drive for money with the drive to help others. 
Now, the vast majority of people in selling today in senior housing are really nice people. They have a, a real high drive to help other people, but normally it starts to get above 55 and uh, higher, and they struggle to be able to you know, uh, produce move-ins because they're so nice, they're not willing to follow up and help the person because they view it as I'm going to be pushy or I'm, you know, I'm going to be offending the person or they just have the reluctance to do it because they just, you know, they just feel unsure of themselves. And so that's where the vast majority of salespeople are today in our industry, which is why, you know, one of the reasons why we struggle because we're not selecting the right kinds of people, but most importantly, we're not helping them master these skills because you can become you can learn a drive for money and results. You can be learned. You, it's hard, but it can be learned. And so this is what's important, that you can measure these things before you hire someone. And these tests are only about $50 a piece in bulk. So anybody at the corporate level listening or regional people who are listening, this is an asset that you want to be using when you're hiring new people. So you have a test that, that you can give people and it will yeah. help you measure where they, where they fall on these scales? That's right. And, and what you also notice is that the top performers have a much stronger drive for ongoing knowledge and development, whereas the bottom performers are really kind of satisfied. You know, I try to turn off the lights when I leave at night and I don't even think about my job until I come back in the next day. Those people tend to be in the bottom performers. And so the top performers have this drive for money or results, the drive to help others, and the drive for knowledge. And so we've been able to you know, scientifically measure this with a good, good, bit, good bit of accuracy. And so uh, anybody who's interested in that, they can, they can email me, and I'll be happy to share how to get those tests uh, that they could use in their, own, in their own industry, or their own company, excuse me. Awesome. Um, so, you know, just just kind of wrapping up here, um, uh, before we get into the questions, you want to um, kind of leave people with, with sort of the big three? Uh, I, I think they're pretty obvious. It's, it's going to get worse in the short term. Uh, my sense is by the middle of 2017, occupancy is going to be down another eh, 100, 150, 200 basis points. Uh, so, you know, if you don't do something, you're going to find your occupancy is going to continue to go down. Uh, occupancy and assisted living has been under a lot of pressure for the last four or five quarters. Independent living has certainly held up better. Um, and eight sales skills do matter, you know, so obviously you, want, you would rather hire people from the outset who have the drive for money, knowledge, balanced by the desire to help. And then certainly if, if you know, right, so where do I start? Most people are like, well, my company's not going to support this. I've got to do this on my own. And so what I would do is I would start with, uh, the book on motivational interviewing, uh, which you'll send out to people. Uh, there are some courses that you can take. I actually run a whole program called Journey to Mastery that if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to share that with them. But uh, you can do this on your own. Uh, you don't need necessarily to have somebody you know, uh, that you have to bring in. It just takes a little longer. It's a little harder, but you can indeed do it. And so, uh, I would just start there, and uh, you will see some significant difference uh, if you can really start to master, uh, you know, asking the open-ended questions, asking permission to get personal, uh, you know, these kind of basic things. You, 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 if you can get that first phone call dramatically different from the, the one that you're doing, uh, you will see improvement. You'll see some significant improvement over six months, and then within two years, you'll see some dramatic improvement. Awesome. All right. Um, let's dive into some questions here. And um, there's actually one that I have for you that I've been thinking about as we've been talking about this presentation. Um, you haven't really mentioned compensation, which of course is a big part of the picture for a salesperson. Can you talk a little bit about what, what a sales manager or an executive director or uh, someone like that could do to structure a sales compensation plan that drives the behaviors we're looking for? Yeah, and this is, you know, it's very controversial because I I'm come from the camp. And again, I, I originally, as an owner, developer, operator, 
Uh, when I first started 30 years ago, I was under the distinct wrong impression that you know we could pay our sales professionals you know a modest amount and and we'd be fine because you know the building should fill itself up and and I was badly mistaken. The the if you find the right sales professional who's as talented as your executive director, your sales professional should be making as much as your executive director. Now that shocks a lot of people, but in my mind if you subscribe to the understanding that occupancy is everything because everything else you're doing you must be good at or you shouldn't even be in the game, then uh, you can understand why maybe I feel that way. But the, your sales professionals have the greatest, uh, most obvious impact on your cash flow and therefore on your success. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, belittling or any way uh, to, you know, minimizing quality of care, quality of service. They must be outstanding. They must be. Uh, now we have a whole other issue on the fact that we don't pay our nurses aides properly and that's broken, dysfunctional, it's just, it's just a disaster. But we're not going to, this is not about that, so we're going to let that alone. But So Generally, what we try to do is that our, our base compensation for our sales professionals would be about 75% of their overall compensation, and then 25% would be incentives based upon their overall performance. We, we don't like specific uh, commissions on every sale, especially if there's more than one person involved in a sale. It just gets... It, 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 does, it doesn't build teamwork. So we like to structure it based upon overall goals uh, for the community that we set together you know, with our sales professionals because you know, once people work to buy in together, there's a much greater chance it's going to happen. So we look at you know, uh, a number of measures in terms of how we actually are handling our calls. Uh, how many visits we are accomplishing, how many move-ins we're getting, and so we have a whole kind of series of things that we measure together that then would help the person achieve the 25% of their incentive compensation. But again, we are looking you know, to try to get people uh, pretty close to what the executive director is making, and that's a you know, that's a, that's a leap for a lot of people. Uh, now, certainly if there's two sales professionals, you know, then it's a different story. But the reality is, um, you know, the old adage, you get what you, what you pay for, you get what you measure and expect. So the reality is that we got to do a better job of finding and compensating outstanding sales professionals. Um, a follow-up question, just quickly, Tony. Do you suggest paying incentives monthly or quarterly? I think again, it depends upon uh, you know each individual company, their needs and the needs of their people. But certainly, uh, quarterly uh, I think is a good approach. Monthly, certainly for people that are using you know a commission structure, I think you know is it, certainly something that people are going to expect. But the reality is, you know, you don't you don't want to penalize people by making it onerous. But at the same time, you want to make sure that whatever system you are using has been agreed upon. Everybody understands it. Everybody believes it's a great system, and it's working for you. But um, we just find that there's, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of gaming that can go on, uh, which is why we like to structure it more so that it's an agreed upon approach and not a fixed formula. You see what I'm saying? We just prefer more flexibility there, uh, but knowing that the employee will get the, the money that they rightly deserve. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here's another question. Um, you know, this whole topic of what do you measure? Do you measure visits? Do you measure calls? Do you measure uh, leads? You know, um, we we actually at Caring will get people. Uh, well, our family advisors will get a call from a community, and they'll say, 
You know, I'm just calling about this family that you sent us back in May, and I wondered if you'd ever heard anything from them. And, you know, you know that they're not really, there's no particular reason that they're making that call other than their manager is measuring how many dolls they make in a day, and this is like one of those, you know, way, way, way outliers. They've called everybody else in their lead bank, and now because they have to make another call, they're calling us and asking about this lead from like six months ago. What do you recommend um, as a measurement, uh, a metric for for people uh, in this well, what, playing the sales game by these new rules? Yeah, once you've properly trained uh, your people and developed them in in these skill sets, then certainly you know you want to measure the amount of productive uh, time that they're spending with prospects, right? Whether it's on the phone, in person, uh, on the internet. So certainly measuring the amount of productive time is probably the most important metric that you can measure, all right? Because the more productive time we spend with the right skills, the, the better our results are going to be. So that would probably be you know, the most important. You know, you do need to measure leads. You can't avoid it. You have to understand where your leads are coming from, what they're costing you, uh, how often that they do close so you can prioritize your leads. And yeah, the internet leads probably, you know, get a bad rap right now. And I think that's slowly changing uh, because the reality is more and more people are, are inquiring through the internet. Uh, but, but the reality is, you know, professional referrals, and referrals from existing residents and families are, are always going to be your best source. So if you're not knowing who they are, you know, then you're making a tragic mistake, catastrophic mistake, because you definitely should be spending far more time uh, with those people than maybe with uh, 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 somebody that came through the Internet who's in pre-contemplation or early contemplation. So you, you do need to measure certain things. And I said productive selling time. You obviously do need to know the number of visits that you're that you're happening, um, you know, because you have to measure move-ins and you have to you have to measure visits. But I I think the second most important thing to measure is the closing ratio of the salespeople. In other words, how many of their visits, people who visited at least once, uh, do actually move in, because ultimately that is what is going to drive you going from 87% to 100%. You yeah. have to be able to improve, help improve the move-in ratio, the closing ratio of all of your salespeople. And if you do, you're going to become a very, very successful company. And then, you know, you share that increased financial success and you treat your people right because it is all about culture. It's all about culture. And if you treat your people right, they're going to stay with you. And if you stay, because right now, turnover of sales professionals is what causes most companies not to be able to create this kind of a, a, a system or a culture. And, you know, most people are turning over 35, 40 percent of their salespeople every year. Yeah. So it's impossible. Yeah, oh, we're getting, we're getting so many good questions. I'm, I hate to cut this off, but I do want to honor people's time. We've got two minutes left. Um, so uh, in conclusion, Tony, I wanted to say thank you so much for spending some time with us. Um, we are going to be sending things out, and we're actually talking to Tony about uh, being a, a regular contributor to the caring.com blog. So I'm thrilled about that and, and anxious to hear more of what he has to say because it's so important. Um, I invite everyone to join us for our next webcast. It's coming up next month. This is Ask Me Anything, a town hall for Caring's directory clients. You'll have the chance to hear right from our people, our family advisor team, who are talking to real live consumers and ask a bunch of questions about how caring works and what sort of things do they hear when they talk to clients on the phone. Um, that will be Thursday, November 10th. Same bat time, same bat channel. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, Here's my contact information. Watch your email for the follow-up materials. And thank you so much, Tony, for a great webinar today. Happy to be with you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.